thanks everybody so much for being here. Uh, my name is Matt Pruitt. I'm the deputy director of Radical Exchange Foundation, and um, I kind of, I wanted to give kind of a different presentation today about something that uh, personally interests me. Uh, so one of the reasons I wanted to, there's a couple of reasons I wanted to talk about Tolstoy. Uh, one is that uh, it's just fascinating, and I think it's fun to talk about, and I hope we get to have a great conversation about it. Uh, the other reason is that I kind of think that uh, Tolstoy belongs in that category with uh, with Henry George as one of these uh, sort of late 19th century radical thinkers who had a set of ideas that represent a little bit of a uh, of a path not traveled in history or an intellectual tradition that we might want to uh, revisit and learn something from. So I'm going to start by. Uh, uh, giving a little bit of background on Tolstoy. Uh, then I'm going to go into uh, just a super speed summary of Tolstoy's theory of art, which he lays out in an 1892 book called What is Art? Uh, then I'm going to try to bring that back to mechanics uh, and design and explain that, what that has, you know, how that has anything to do with what we're talking about at this conference, and uh, then open it up for conversation with uh, Mary Ellen and, and Ruth and, uh, and anybody else who is interested. Okay, so uh, everybody knows Tolstoy as a great novelist. We all know that he wrote War and Peace and Anna Karenina, and is one of the great you know, novelists of the, of, the, of the 19th century. But there's this whole other side of Tolstoy that is uh, less well known. Um, and the, the, the way to kind of get into that is uh, with the fact that when Tolstoy was in middle age, when he was around 50, uh, after he published his great books and you know was celebrated for the world over as a brilliant novelist, uh, and he was rich, he had massive inherited estates, he kind of had it all, uh, but he went through like a massive spiritual crisis. He just came to the conclusion that life had no meaning and that his uh, work was worthless and he disavowed everything he'd written and um, uh, kind of had a, a spiritual crisis. He started to get into Christianity, he started to educate himself about all kinds of other um, uh, uh, spiritual traditions. And um, uh, around this time, he also got really interested in the economic theories of Henry George. So uh, there, in fact, there's a, there's a sort of an unconfirmed rumor that uh, when Tolstoy was on his deathbed, he was uh, busy rambling to his many visitors about uh, uh, how they needed to learn about Henry George and how Henry George's ideas about land would, uh, would save humanity. Uh, so he was uh, he became an opponent of private property. Uh, he wanted to give away uh, his own lands. He wanted to give away the rights to, to his uh, works, much to the chagrin of his wife. Uh, he uh, and he also inspired uh, like a whole net global sort of network of collective living experiments um, uh, that were put together by people who were inspired by Tolstoy's spiritual writings and. Uh, his ideas about how to relate to land and how people ought to relate to each other, and so on. And um, uh, he, he, his writings on nonviolence were an enormous inspiration for like pretty much all of the major 20th century thinkers about nonviolence. And for evidence of this connection, you need to really look no farther than the fact that one of these collective farms uh, was established in South Africa by Gandhi in 1910. He called it Tolstoy farm. So Gandhi was like directly influenced by uh, Tolstoy's ideas about nonviolence. Um, all right. So um, I've already mentioned the idea of nonviolence. I think it's an important context for this whole conversation is to see the centrality of that concept in uh, in Tolstoy's thinking. So I have a picture of a hedgehog here, which is kind of a long story. There's like a, there's an Isaiah uh, Berlin essay called. And the hedgehogs, in which the hedgehog is kind of stand in for uh, systematic thinkers who believe that there are certain concepts that uh, shed light on all the other concepts. And, and for Tolstoy, that concept really was nonviolence. He saw that as the core of his personal interpretation of, of Christianity, uh, which, by the way, uh, had uh, little or nothing to do with like uh, institutional church Christianity. He was excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, his version of Christianity really had more in common with uh, 
like the Quaker tradition or the Unitarian tradition or other kind of peace ministries in the United States, uh, uh, with whom he came into dialogue late in his life and you know, came to discover that they've been saying a lot of the same things he'd been saying before he was saying them. So uh, he, uh, 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 nonviolence is just core to, to all his ideas about many things, including, including art. So uh, this is, these are my words, but you know, the, the, the kind of the thesis here is that for Tolstoy, the purpose of art as well as the purpose of other kind of human enterprises, including science, is in a nutshell, promoting nonviolence and brotherly union. He basically wanted people to build connections with one another, to see one another's humanity, and he thought, and he, he saw this as so important that you know it, it was sort of for him like the proper animating goal of uh, of, of art, as well as other things. So uh, let me go into a little bit more detail about uh, what. Is okay. So the first, uh, the first like surprising move that Tolstoy makes in his uh, in his explication of art is he just rails against the idea of beauty. Uh, he does not. He thinks that beauty is like the wrong criterion that uh, you know shouldn't be worried about. It. And to, to put a slightly finer point on on this, uh, he, he saw it as this kind of uh, he, he was you know obviously like this is, his, his thinking is like completely Eurocentric. That, that is what it is, but his, uh, the, the way that he talks about it is that uh, in, the, in the Renaissance, as European artists moved away from like, uh, like icons and church art and that kind of thing, they, uh, what, what they did is they, re, they, they embraced these more classical ideals that, they came, that came from, from classical Greek art. And Tolstoy thought that in so doing, they repeated a mistake the Greek artists had made, which was the uh, basically the conflation of goodness and beauty. So Tolstoy thought that in, in, in classical Greek art, what you see is like this unity of the idea of goodness and beauty. They didn't see any distinction between those two concepts. Tolstoy thought there was an extremely important distinction between these two concepts. And uh, in repeating that mistake, Renaissance artists like set European art on the wrong track. And uh, uh, to Put a little bit more color on that. It's like the it, Renaissance artists in Tolstoy's eyes were essentially creating uh, creating material that was pleasing to their elite, wealthy patrons, like the Medici's. They were creating things that were interesting and pleasing and, and beautiful from the eyes of the you know in the eyes of the elite uh, group of people that he was that, that they were working for, um, and that were sort of like irrelevant and essentially incomprehensible to the rest of society. So they allowed they allow this elite clique of, uh, of you know, art appreciators um, to, to form. And you know, you could just, it, there's a lot more to be said, but you get a rough idea of this, but just when you look at the uh, Venus there, it's, it's like references to Greek mythology that you would never get if you weren't really educated, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so essentially, he thinks that, that Renaissance art starts to create this conflation of art with luxury and to make art like an exclusive thing. Um, some art from Tolstoy's own time that he had harsh words for included like uh, symbolist painting. Um, uh, you know, th he, th he thought that this kind of this kind of thing made similar mistakes to what you would see in Renaissance art. It uh, it, it celebrates uh, this idea of like leisure that would have been incomprehensible or not incomprehensible, but just unrelatable to a anyone who wasn't uh, who wasn't wealthy. And it has these just vague, mushy references to uh, material that only educated people would believe. And he just thought he just didn't think that there was any any compelling moral sort of uh, message to this kind of stuff. And he didn't like it. Um, and again, you know, you can sort of agree or disagree with with Tolstoy, um, but you know, it's important to just sort of catch his drift here. Um, you, more kind of stuff that he didn't like, you know. Tolstoy <laughs> <laughs> you know, would have seen this as like, like essentially just a you know a, a embodiment of of uh, the power of the few over the many. Uh, you know, this this kind of work simply can't be created unless there's this unless there are massive numbers of people working to just serve the pleasure of a very few. Um, all right, so another important uh, idea is that he, he viewed art as an inherently social enterprise. He thought that it brings people together. Um, but he 
recognize that that can have a dark side, um, that you know, sometimes art can unite certain exclusive groups and set them against others. And so for that reason, he didn't, he didn't like uh, patriotic art, uh, church art, and he didn't like uh, elite art. He didn't like elite art that was only accessible to a, a social or uh, economic elite. Um, related to all this, um, he, or he sort of sums up uh, his, um, his objection by speaking against the idea of art for its own sake. He thought this was sort of a sleight of hand or sleight of, sort of an abdication, uh, which um, you know, provides cover for artists to sort of, uh, for art to devolve into something that is essentially something for pleasure and something for the uh, consolidation and you know, projection of power by the, uh, by the upper classes in society. Okay, so you know, it's important to keep in mind that when he was writing this, he was like you know, kind of an old curmudgeonly uh, guy, and he had a lot of harsh words for artists who are, you know, in, in many ways justly admired by, by many people. So, you know, he didn't hate everything. Uh, what, did, uh, what kind of stuff did Tolstoy like? And again, this may run to your tastes or it may not, but it's important to, uh, you know, let's try to catch his drift. Uh, so he liked, uh, he, he didn't like everything from this sort of 19th century realist genre, but, uh, but his tastes did run in that direction. Uh, he, he liked art that sheds light on the common human experience. Uh, he specifically references this painting uh, as one that he, that he really loves in the book. Um, and you know, you can see why he liked it. Uh, well, one reason he liked it is that it, it's, it takes no background to understand. It could be understood by anybody who sees it. You see, like, you can sort of see the humanity of that person, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from. You understand this is a, a person who's uh, tired from a long day of work, depicted with respect, the kind of thing that, uh, you know, shows you an aspect of life that you may not have considered, depending on where you come from or where you're from, and that uh, might, might encourage uh, sort of a, a feeling of, of connection with, with, with that. Uh, depicted person. Um, narrative art that he liked included uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harry Peter Stowe, um, which, which of course is like, you know, what, what he liked about that was that it, it of course helped many white people in the United States recognize the humanity of enslaved people in the United States. Um, you, you know, it, it's not a perfect work, but uh, that was what he liked about it. Um, the uh, he liked uh, the work of Hugo Dickens, and he also liked sort of simple, like folk stories, Homer, Bible stories, the story of the Buddha. He specifically talks about the story of uh, Jacob being sold into slavery by his brothers. Um, it's as just something that you can, um, anybody can relate to, anybody can understand the, the, the feeling of, of sibling jealousy, of betrayal, this kind of thing. Um, you know, and, and um, uh, a lot of these, a lot of Bible stories, a lot of stories from mythology and uh, and from Eastern religion are just these, just these incredibly, uh, incredibly to the point, poignant narratives about deep, important aspects of human experience. Um, and uh, uh, Tolstoy viewed that sort of stuff as promoting um, promoting nonviolence. Um, this is another painting by a. Um, an artist that Tolstoy admired, um, named uh, Nikolai Gay. Um, this is a this is a, a picture of um, uh, Peter the Great uh, interrogating his son Alexei. The backstory here, which which you know Russian audiences would have known, is that um, uh, Peter the Great's son Alexei uh, didn't want to be the czar. He didn't want to take on the the mantle of, of family responsibility. He ran away to Austria. He tried to betray the interests of, of Russia, and then he was brought back in, in shame and disgrace, and uh, he actually ended up being tortured to death by, um, by his father. Um, and uh, you know, in this painting, you can just see, like, these are, these are the two most powerful people in Russia, and two of the very most powerful people in the world, but they're depicted as, you know, not unlike uh, any of us. Uh, you know, you just, you have a, a Disappointed, angry, hurt, uh, red-faced father, and and you know, shame-faced son. Um, it's it he it, it, it just humanizes the subject, and you know that was something that Tolstoy was a big fan of. Um, 
Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, Tolst you know, this criterion of like non-violent to human connection, Tolstoy didn't see it as, as only the proper aim for art. He also saw it as a proper aim for all kinds of other realms of human enterprise, including science. So there's, there's this one nice quote. There's a million nice quotes to choose from in this book, but uh, one of them is, uh, science and art are as closely tied to each other as lungs and heart, so that if one organ is perverted, the other cannot function properly. He saw all these different realms of human life as kind of uh, um, working on different aspects of the same problem, which is to essentially create a better world. Um, and I would add that, I don't know if, if how many of you were in uh, the conversation between Boots and, and Glenn on, on Friday, but a lot of the themes that I'm you know, picking up on here were, were brought up very strongly in that, in that talk as well. Uh, so, uh, interestingly, Tolstoy was against, uh, he, he kind of, in the conclusion to what is art, where he kind of expands this idea to realms beyond art, he talks about science for its own sake and explains that he doesn't, he, he, he finds that to be a flawed doctrine for the same reason that he doesn't like the idea of art for its own sake. Uh, he thinks that uh, if we just view science as a good in and of itself, you know, it doesn't have to have reference to anything else. Um, he, he worries that science becomes something that we use to simply pursue our own idle curiosity or something that we use to um, uh, um, uh, create like uh, technical advancements that create power and wealth for the already powerful and already wealthy. Um, so what does any of this have to do with uh, egalitarian mechanisms? Um, long story short, I, I, think, I just think that the frame of nonviolence and the criterion of nonviolence is actually an extremely valuable uh, lens through which to look at, um, at our these sorts of fundamental redesigns of, of institutions that, that we're talking about at this conference. So we're talking about basic institutions like uh, one person, one vote democracy, private property. One thing that we haven't talked about, but that I, I hope to, I, I've written a little bit about, and then I hope to do more work on, is the institution of criminal punishment. Um, all of these institutions, uh, understood properly, understood you know, to the bottom, are things that are sustained by, by violence. Um, you, know, you, can, you, you cannot protect private property without the threat of violence. You cannot, uh, uh, you know, the, the results of an election will not be good without the, some kind of uh, threat of violence hanging over you. And of course, um, uh, criminal punishment is you know, di directly violent. I mean, it, it's violence itself. Um, and so I, the, the ways that we might improve these institutions can, I think, quite simply, quite profitably be understood as attempts to uh, make them less dependent on, um, on violence. Uh, so diving a little bit deeper into the idea of private property, uh, it's it's just sort of obvious from a historical perspective that private property has its has its roots in, in, in violent institutions, and you know arguably some of the arguably things like the shift from from feudal land tenure where the king is just saying you know this is my land or else I'll hurt you, uh, you know arguably you move to a slightly less uh, a violent version of that institution when you open it up to private property markets. You may agree or disagree with that, but you can sort of see what I'm getting at here. Um, you know, and yet the it's clearly private property markets are still sustained by violence. They can't exist without violence. You know, when you have a um, whenever, whenever the government <coughs> recognizes a, a claim of private property, the government is concomitantly recognizing an array of acts uh, for which punishment is threatened. Uh, which you know you could, which are essentially the crimes against that property, um, uh, and uh, it, it strikes me as a worthy aim to you know as we kind of get to the root of our institutions, it strikes me as a worthy aim to minimize the dependence of our institutions on um, on this threat of violence. It may be impossible to remove it entirely, but maybe we can sort of get closer. Um, a few words about. Uh, criminal punishment, um, this is obviously um, a, a really complicated one, uh, but um, one of the kind of, you know, loftier dreams of 
of the various sort of uh, movements that we're, that we're bringing together with radical exchange. One of the sort of loftier dreams is to imagine kind of grassroots or decentralized associations providing public goods that governments might otherwise provide. Um, and you know, there, there's a lot of talk like, well, okay, could, you know, could sort of decentralized public good providers in some sense replace governments or, sh or cause governments to shrink? Uh, maybe, but it's important to realize that governments, governments really give us two things in, in one way of thinking about it. They give us public goods, but they also uh, threaten punishment. They have a monopoly on the use of force. And um, kind of, you know, grassroots, decentralized, um, democratically governed public goods providers ostensibly would not have um, uh, any sort of claim, uh, you know, authority to, 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 to punish or, or to use violence. And that's kind of precisely the point. That's kind of the appeal of that sort of uh, method of, of rethinking institutions. Uh, if we, you know, if we do our jobs correctly, we might move towards a world in which the social order is created more by incentives and less by disincentives, more by carrots, less by sticks. That strikes me as a desirable goal. Okay, so bringing it back to art, um, I think that you know, as we as we think about these very lofty, very ambitious, very very high-minded uh, um, ideas, uh, I think art is indispensable. Tolstoy, is Tolstoy, um, all that presently makes it possible for men to live together independently of the fear of violence and punishment. And in our time, an enormous part of the order of life is based on this. All of it has been brought about by art. Um, I. Uh, I could sign my name under that. I think that that is a great way of thinking about uh, the role of art in society. Um, and I think that uh, you know, we frankly we need uh, we need artists, we need creative people to help imagine what a uh, what a what a more um, desirable, peaceful um, society might look like. Um, a couple more words about this is just that you know art art can help us uh, art, at its best it, it helps us understand one another it helps us understand things like the pain of poverty and oppression it helps us understand things like the hollowness of wealth and power and um, and it can also help us under, understand the the attractiveness of, of like a fairer and more equal mode of uh, living together um, so that's my uh, quick presentation. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear what uh, Mary Ellen or what uh, anyone else in this room uh, has to say. It doesn't need to do that. So, 
in going back to the German and philosophy and both in the consideration of design or the being of the being um, from Heidegger, but then also, I mean, I would steer more towards Hegel and Nietzsche on that and that really what the work of art does is make us aware of our own existence, right? That's, if something is successful, that's all it can do. And be that in a work of literature, music, film, right, um, you know, visual arts. Um, the one thing that Tolstoy does criticize is food and food culture. Um, and talking about, you know, sort of believing that it's very decadent and that it's something that really doesn't need to be considered. I don't think the culinary arts is actually an art. I mean, food is food. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then and art, and, I, mean, I, I, I really, I liked the way that it came out in the conversation uh, between Boots and Glad, actually, where, you know, Boots, I, I think, like, you know, I think maybe if you sort of overread Tolstoy, which I've perhaps done, you, you can... Uh, which is fine. Yeah, yeah but you, you can get this, yeah. you can get this idea, and I think Tolstoy had the idea that that promoting good or promoting nonviolence is like a, like a firm criterion for what makes art good art. That might be uh, that might be too strong of an interpretation, yeah. right? So what you know what Boots was saying, uh, which resonated with me, was that you know what he's <coughs> up to is uh, he wants to be a good person. He wants to promote what he wants to promote in the world. He wants to help. He wants his art to be a tool to bring about the world that he wants to see, that may not exhaust um, the mission of art. That may not exhaust uh, you know, the, um, the characteristics that make art good art. Um, and I think, uh, I think you're, you're right that art can also kind of make us understand ourselves like, in a more individual way as opposed to having this like, social function, you know, helping us understand one another. Yeah, I mean, and, and how you, I mean, in terms of, you know, going to Kant and a number of other people, but how you end up reaching some kind of consensus, right? Like, if I go to see, you know, uh, the Rivera murals here in Detroit, which are incredible, which were, didn't get sold, along with some other things, fortunately. But once I go to that and I leave that space, having seen that work, which represents, you know, is, is ex very political, right, and it's making, and social realism, but I leave that space and I go out to you and I say, oh, have you gone to see those works? You have or you haven't, but then at a certain point maybe you have, and then we start this discussion of which we have this consensus. And it only takes the two of us to make that thing exist, right? So then how that then goes out into how it radiates in a larger sense from that point. And look, at it's a numbers game. If you have a painting versus a novel versus a movie, right, there's an exponential difference in terms of who those audience members are. But then there's also the potency of that individual work versus those other things that get distributed and disseminated in a different manner. So what are the other ways in which that can happen now, right? We're yeah. seeing that in a variety of manners. I mean, I think you know, one of the things with all the sort of criticism of social media, you know, what we saw yesterday when Saman Avarli was speaking about how, you know, they're actually using for the show that they produce, the Voice of America, they had something that they did called Parasite, and then there's another show that's called Tablet, where this woman, and they literally use Instagram and Facebook as the way to produce content that they put back in show and they have millions of viewers that are looking at this so in a certain sense all of that is material right I mean and how you utilize that material I mean there's always going to be scale changes and amplification and distortion and sometimes it's just about one person having that experience with that thing at that particular moment I mean that can be in and of itself enough I mean yeah so yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, it, it's definitely important, first of all, to, to uh, like, situate Tolstoy in the 19th century. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, I think it's, like, a pretty obvious mistake to, 
to think that okay, well, we should like still be making social realist paintings or something. Well, people but, do. I mean, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know that that's clearly not like the only way. Yeah. You know yeah. to um, you know to make art that um, that promotes or I shouldn't say I don't maybe the, the word promote is the, the wrong word but art that like embodies some kind of positive vision or helps us move towards a, a positive vision. Um, there are all kinds of ways to do it that uh, and I think it can be mass media or it can be like a completely personal thing that only one person sees. Um, it's really just, um, it's, it's, it's an idea basically. It's, a, it's something, to, something to strive for and something to, you know, um, uh, Guide, guide things, I guess. Yes. So, what are some examples of things that you think promote or advance or whatever verb you want to use uh, nonviolence today? Uh, um, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think there's, I don't have like the perfect answer on top of head, but I think that, I think that Boots Riley's work uh, is. Is a, is a good example. Um, I think that he, um, uh, you know, like the movie Sorry to Bother You, uh, watched sensitively can, you know, puts you in, puts you in, in a uh, position that might not be familiar to you, or that, you know, that causes you to sort of step outside of yourself um, and um, uh, see things like, through somebody else's eyes. Um, so, do you think it's about empathy? I mean, does that I'm a fan of empathy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, this might be like the obvious troll question, you know, but we're talking about the Tolstoy and his philosophy. Um, it's, and, it, and I'm just assuming that if not his greatest work, his most acclaimed work, was made before he thought that stuff. Yeah. So did he make any good art after he? <laughs> <laughs> so you know. No, it's a great. But I think he. Uh, I, 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 I think after this theory of art, his uh, philosophy was better than his art. <laughs> but, but 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 it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and just trying to add yeah. to the philosophy when they talk about beauty. You know, and you mentioned philosophers, more later philosophers, but all philosophers up until the 1800s, they, you know, talked about ethics, you know, metaphysics, and beauty. Beauty was one of the things, you know, that yeah. the philosophers defined, you know. Yeah. You know, that was like, it was something we needed in the world. Like, you know, yeah. or Aristotle and on, you know, like, to just disregard that. I mean, I feel like that should be, Yeah. beauty has value. Well, I, 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 I don't think beauty is valueless, but I will stand up for Tolstoy on that one because I think that I think that beauty um, uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, basically, and that's kind of the problem. Um, if you focus on making things that an audience finds beautiful, then you're focused on your audience, and you can sort of divide society. Um, that, you know, and, and you can allow your audience to become insular. Yeah, I mean, I'm going through this lens versus yeah. beauty of Oh, adding something aesthetic that you brings joy to your life. Yeah. Maybe even like a vignette yeah. of time. There's a little pain in your house. You walk by it, light hits it a certain way. You look at it for two, three seconds. It's a little moment of time of beauty, a vignette, you know, a little piece of art. Yeah. I mean, I know it's not causing social good and changing the world, yeah. but hey, it made you feel a little better from it. Yeah. You know? And and I will. I, I, it's important not to concede too much because the. Uh, like Tolst after Tolstoy started thinking in this way, you know, he did write some of his some of his better stuff, like the death of Ivan Illich yeah, yeah. and um, right, right. Um, uh, the yeah. Novella Resurrection and things like that. So, um, uh, you know, that a lot of people would still prefer War and Peace, but those are those are valuable. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. But just on, on beauty, like, um, are we not talking about two different things, like the canons of, of beauty that like mm -hmm. used against, like, you know, like what Renaissance and then the definition of that beauty? Doesn't um, negate like all the philosophical research on like what beauty is because you know yeah like you know like you could argue that the Monet painting is more beautiful than like um, um, the, the Venice of Milan. And I don't know. I was right about that. Yeah. Just 
quickly. I, I think I, I lived in Detroit. We're in Detroit. Uh, I think a lot about um, contribution, kind of outsized cultural contributions from, from this place over time. Um, I think about kind of the misalignment of uh, goals between the artistic community and the, and the culture in the city now and kind of corporate America coming in. And there seems to be this kind of awkward misalignment of incentives where, on the one hand, uh, kind of the culture and the, and the art of Detroit is part and the soul is what makes it so that's what's drawing people here. But then there seems to be it's deprioritized in the, um, with, with corporations. When you look at the Amazon bid, for example, there's no talk on how that might affect culture, et cetera. Um, within the radical, uh, within this whole line of thinking, how 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 would how could you potentially be better aligning uh, incentives such that kind of the, the business growth and economic development isn't uh, doesn't get misaligned? I don't know why it does that, but yeah. how do you how do you uh, address that in, in kind of new thinking? Uh, well, I think the simplest answer is just uh, uh, sharing wealth. <coughs> yeah, like literally sharing wealth. Uh, you know. I, money is important. Money really matters. And you know, if, if some people aren't getting money from something, they have a lot less reason to care about it or root for it or want it than people who are. Um, uh, so, I, I guess you know, I, I hope to, um, you know, I hope that through our, you know, through these ideas about mechanism design, we can sort of create create businesses and and economies that could just produce more shared wealth, more, you know, more distributed power. Also, but it ends up being a participatory process, too. I mean, you know, look at, where is Amazon going to land now? Look at what happened in New York. I mean, where it was about engaging in this dialogue, and then when there was any little bit of pushback on it, they were like, hmm, we're going to pack our bags and go home. And it's like, you know, that's, it's juvenile in a way. I mean, and then you even have the governor coming back and like pleading with them, no, please, 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 begging them to come back. It's like they should be, it's a dialogue that's being created and the impact that that can have on the community, everybody understands, right? I mean, what's in Long Island City has been primarily cultural institutions. People have been moving out there, but what that, the impact that was gonna have in that area was gonna be huge, right? So. If anybody is sort of questioning what that sort of corporate presence is going to be, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think, you know, the one thing that's so great about being in Detroit is to see how everybody sort of held on, right, through all the difficult periods, and you can see how significant the change is, and to then be and determine what that is, right? Because you're the residents that are living here. It's your community and the companies are coming in, but they need you, right? I mean, it's it, it's something that's being done, it should be, it's done in partnership, but it's your determination with everybody. I mean, I think that's one of the things I'm really impressed by, and like Allied Media, who we also were, you know, had a, a part of some of, in many of these conversations here, has done significant work <coughs> that is a model for so many other places in, not only in the U.S. but in the world, right? So, you mentioned uh, empathy, and I feel like I've heard more conversation over the past few years as, as like art that uh, strives for empathy as like a form of tourism or appropriation. I'm just curious how I don't know. Yeah, empathy seems like maybe something we should strive for. It seems like. Yeah. Weird that people are like against empathy, but I kind of get what they're saying. I'm just curious if you all have thoughts on that. I I, I think I, I think people who are against empathy like have something in mind that isn't empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's like you know, like condescension or, or tourism, as you say, right? I mean, there, there there is that. So you you can have things that resemble empathy on the surface, or that masquerade as empathy that aren't genuine empathy, and and I'm. I'm against that as much as anybody, but there is such a thing as real empathy, and let's not forget about that, and let's try to have it. Can I, say, can I just compliment something about this? I actually talked to somebody yesterday that brought a similar point to your saying, isn't it empathy a form of appropriation to say that I could possibly be in the position of this person that has such a different, um, 
reality than mine, wouldn't it be um, some type of appropriation to say that I can't understand where they come from because I can't? Yeah. But then um, I think um, I think there is a threshold of how much you can understand the other, and I'm an actress, and I feel like the craft and learning about how to put yourself in the position of someone, or how the reality of other can fit in yourself is a skill, like it's techniques, it's something you can learn, and that we, we all could be thinking more about what are those things that we could be like training ourselves to push the limit of the threshold of how much we can understand the experience of the other. Uh, thank you for saying that. I just think that's a fantastic point. And it's, uh, I, uh, empathy, uh, we should not make the mistake of thinking that empathy can be perfect or that thinking that empathy can be infinite. We should, you know, we should try to have more of it and we should also understand that it has a limit, you know, and not, not, not use that as an excuse to, to be, Careless, but to, you know, just understand the, the limits of our understanding. I think a lot of these criticisms also come up frequently when uh, there's a sense of injustice in, in kind of like who gets to communicate that story. So, um, you know, you can kind of like take on a role or try to try to um, to to kind of sketch out a story that's not yours to tell um, and. Yeah, there, there's a, a sense of fairness that kind of like is wrapped up in, in a lot of um, this, this type of like empathetic artwork. Yeah, I, I just want to add on that as well. I, I think that sometimes we get caught up on these semantics. Can you speak like, up? So I, I think sometimes we get caught up on the semantics of, of like appropriation and things like that versus, you know, I, I, I think empathy as, a, as an example, you have mirror neurons in your system that you just get shown something and happening to a sentient being and you empathize like you just so art as a way of exposing you to something that you maybe didn't understand or didn't see or didn't quite see that way just will create empathy if done the, if, without any training I mean you can do better by training possibly as well but you're designed for empathy as a, as a human being yeah. so yeah. That's what you're doing. I mean, you know, you're setting up a set of conditions where where there can be a myriad of readings, right? I mean, you can't ultimately make a determination for somebody what that thing is going to be or do for them. You can't. To presume that is is you know is a form of sort of arrogance and impossibility. But what you can do, I think, is that you you make the work and. People, you know, it depends on what you're doing, but there's a myriad of approaches that you can take to set up certain conditions where some possibility of that can occur. Yeah. And ultimately, it's only your own response, right? I mean, that's that's the thing that you have that you can maintain, and and you know, is it empathy? Is it respect? <laughs> is it autonomy? Is it um, you know, what what is that? Um, and I think to go back to what you were talking about, the semantics is, you know, an important point to make. Uh, how these things are both categorized and um, and then universalized, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one one really important um, yeah. thing about the way that I think about these kinds of issues yeah. is that um, I think whenever you're talking about these kinds of uh, abstract ideas, abstract ideals like empathy or justice yeah. or whatever. You sort of have um, you have a choice between um, uh, like what I like to call epistemic humility and ontological humility. So you can you can say you can say okay, well, maybe empathy is like a not real. Maybe empathy is just a just a BS concept, and we shouldn't worry about it. Or justice is anything BS concept. Or you can say that um, that well, it's a concept. It's out there, and I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't. I cannot fully see it. I don't know exactly what it entails, and uh, and I'm engaged in the project of trying to um, trying to improve my my understanding, trying to refine my 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 definition of that of that ideal, which is by definition a worthy one. Um, and I think that some kind of mixture of epistemic humility and ontological humility. 
responsibility is is always important. Um, and uh, sometimes we fall into the trap of of not not doing the epistemic humility thing enough, not not realizing that okay, like accepting the validity of, of something like justice or empathy or uh, can can kind of help push us in the right direction because it, it pulls us into that that project of, of trying to define it and trying to get closer to it. I had a remark about the idea of the intentional community, which is really inspiring and uh, in Tolstoy's time, it was very important, and he was, like, take the example of Monte Verica, for example, where he was, Herman Hayes, Kropotkin, and the list goes on. Yeah. But they were very much uh, avant garde and an elite, and yeah. this kind of tradition continues today. So, like, people go to Burning Man, but then they go back to their <laughs> shitty tech startups, yeah. white people. Right. So, how do you go from the <laughs> idea of the intentional community or the CAG to a global change of uh, you know, consciousness and politics? Yeah. Uh, Personally, I'm very uh, unsure about intentional communities. Um, I, I I'm not saying there's no way to do it well, but I'm like I don't. I, I guess that, that's all I'll say. I'm just not. I'm not sure what the right way to do that is. I think it's tricky. Can you define intentional? Intentional community. I, you know, I, I would just say that's. You know, people intentionally like radically re, uh, rearranging their way of living into you know a, a, a commune, whether it's rural or urban. I I think I'm on board with the idea that Tolstoy's uh, proposition here aligns well with what we might call like social practice or or like uh, art that, that kind of engages like cultural criticism. Um, I don't, I'm not totally uh, sure about the like broader definition of violence that's being used. Okay. Um, so the, like I think you can, uh, there's obviously like acts of physical violence, um, but there's like a lot of kind of gray area and um, it seems like the, the autonomous uh, uh, kind of Cooperative entities that you're describing um, do you rel do you kind of rely on sticks in some way, and these, these are predominantly like economic or social yeah. like violence. Yeah, it's kind of a harsh word, but um, maybe you can just expand on that like definition of violence and. and uh, yeah, it's a great question, and uh, I guess I I think that's like part of the project. That, you know, we need to work on part of you know because you're you're right that you know, like let's say you have a to make this more concrete like let's say you have some kind of a, some kind of a sort of horizontal or grassroots organization that provides a public good it doesn't have the authority to punish you but it, but it probably does have and probably needs the authority to like withdraw its benefit from you and that can obviously have violent consequences and that can you know that can cause cause real harm and so. Um, uh, I, I don't have a great answer to that, except to say that like that's exactly what we should be thinking about, worrying yeah. about. I mean, the, it seems like reputation and kind of economic punishment are two of the kind of dimensions yeah. along yeah. which a lot of people work with. Um, maybe this is a better, a better you know, territory to be working in than than physical violence. Though, I, would you yeah, I, I would. I would. Uh, you know. Um, I agree with that. I mean, I think there are worse kinds of violence. Some, some violence is worse than others. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to bring up conceptual art that uses finance as a medium. Uh, like I think of Andrea Frazier's institutional yeah. critique where she uses finance as the medium to do that, or Mike Merrill who sells shares of himself and allows buyers to vote on how he lives his life. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how um, Art and specifically art that deals with finance offers a different framework to kind of approach a number of the issues that we've talked about at this conference, as opposed to like say starting a startup or something. It yeah, offers, like, that's a, a good way. example. I mean, and even Jennifer, who's a part of the track, and uh, she was going to be on this, but she self enclosed her shares to make it possible. So, I mean, first of all, you do, you think of it; it's material, right? All of these things are materials, and how they can be utilized. And I think when you're using it as an artist, it's unsuspecting. 
So what happens is you can actually put these things into actual practice in some way. They maintain either both as the work of art, you know, conceptually speaking, or they then actually take on their own life in reality and, and become that thing as either an institution or an actual mechanism or something that's actually utilized. So with that, it's a really actually good position to be in because your, um, you know, initially it can, there can be, it can, you can be, you know, patronized, right, in terms of how it's treated because you're an artist and so nobody really takes it seriously. But when in fact, it can have a huge social and political impact. So be it, you know, as you're talking about finance or, I mean, there's, near, there's so many ways and arenas that you can, you can work in. I mean, I personally have been working with radio frequency and spectrum. And to treat that as a 21st century form of land art, right? It's a public good, it's a public space. How you can utilize that, how you participate in those policy conversations. So I'm actively a part of the FCC when they're talking about how that can be utilized. So is that a social form, right? In terms of like an expansion of what we'll say? Sure, of course it is. But it's then, how far do you end up taking it and then where, like, is there some end result and does it have to be some kind of utility, right? So it goes back to what I was saying is that the work of art only has to be itself, right? It doesn't have to function with this other purpose or goal in mind, but it can, that can happen. And I think that's what you're saying. Those are good examples of what you're talking about. There's also a woman named Sarah Mayohas who created something called Bitcoin, um, where she was selling shares of her works of art early on when she was a graduate student at Yale. She didn't take that any further. I mean, they ended up creating like a limited, of course, amount, and then closed the whole thing down. But um, you know, that's an example. So, and I think that what happens when it these kinds of works are made within the arts world, they end up getting amplified, right? So when I was talking about the sort of scale and the distribution and dissemination, that amplification comes from just the consideration of those things as materials. And look at, you know, it's always been the case that people working in a contemporary manner are either looking at and working with what's happening right now or they're mining what's happened before, right? I mean, you know, why paint, that's why painting is still continuing to be relevant, I mean, and what's being depicted in that, but as, you know, both the material and what can be done, and as the physical object as a commodity, it always has its place, I mean, and will continue, so. Well, we're over time. So we Hello. Maybe, yep. maybe one more or...